Hello and welcome to the Up Level Your Life podcast. I am your host, Amy Innes. I am a mama of two and the CEO of a successful wellness business. I know all too well what it is like to juggle multiple hats and I am on a mission to help you ditch the toxic shit in your home, your mind and your life so that you can live vibrantly. Throughout each episode, we will dive deep with industry experts to discuss all things health, well-being, and mindset. And I hope the raw, inspirational stories will light you up and the knowledge and tools shared will empower you to up-level your life. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Up Level Your Life. Today, I have the wonderful Tamsin Ravel, who is the founder of Farming Revolution. So this is a platform for, for people to learn about regenerative farming. It's something that I see as one of the most important global movements of all time. And this platform includes the Farming Revolution and a popular Farming Revolution uh, YouTube channel. So Welcome, Tamsin. I know this is such a, a massive area um, of information that we could dive into and probably have multiple podcasts, um, but I am so excited to have you here to talk about regenerative farming and the importance of that. Um, so welcome. Thanks, Amy. It's great to be here. I'll try and answer as much as I can. Um, it is a massive topic. Um, and if you do stumble over regenerative, just call it regen. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and what, I guess my first question would be, what led you on the path of regenerative farming? Uh, yeah, I um, think I was 38, maybe 39, and I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, um, Graves' disease, and that's hyperthyroidism. So mm -hmm. your thyroid is under attack from your um, pituitary gland to produce a lot of thyroxin, and it's producing too much already. So this all help, um, speeds up your metabolism, so you lose loads of weight, you become really anxious, you have um, you sweat a lot. Um, your heartbeat goes through the roof. I was trying to go to sleep with my heart pounding in my chest at 98 beats per minute. Um, and so it, it, it whacks you completely. It, it's like derailing you off, off a railway line, which is your life. Um, and you're trying to do all these things. But because your body is is just under attack by its from itself, uh, you can't function. And I got really angry with my body because um, my brain is the one that's super hyperactive and, and tends to not cope with life too much. My body's been really grounded and really solid and something that I could actually rely on. Mm. And then all of a sudden it's attacking itself. And I'm going, no, 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 this doesn't happen to me. I don't get sick. Um, I'm not just going to sit down and, and accept the, the fact that I'm in, I'm a woman. I'm in the right age bracket. This is what normally happens. And I sat in the specialist's office and I said, no, this is not normal. But for, for him, of course, being a specialist, it is normal. Every person yeah. that comes through the door has a thyroid issue. Um, and I'm sitting there and he sort of got this wry smile on his face. And I said, no, I, this is not normal. <laughs> um, but he did ask me, he said, are you on soy milk? And I said, yeah, I've been on soy milk for the past two years because I can no longer drink dairy. Mm. Now I'm a Jersey girl. And so I've been brought up on full fat, yellow, creamy beautiful jersey milk straight out of the jersey cow um, and never broken a bone in my body always being able to drink it not a problem and then I came to Australia when I was about 26 I think and I couldn't handle the milk over here for whatever reason it gradually got worse and worse now in hindsight what it was was it wasn't to do with the lactose it wasn't to do with anything else except they're homogenizing it mm. and it meant my body didn't recognize it as milk um, and so it was just making me feel awful so then I swapped and I tried almond milk and rice milk and all the other milks that are out there and it was soy milk that I seemed to like the most even though it was nothing compared to dairy milk um, and then, yeah, big shock when I'm sat in the thyroid specialist office and he said, get off it now, because that's one of the things that actually does trigger off thyroid issues. Mm, yeah, I, I have thyroid issues myself. And it, it's really interesting when you when you first start diving into um, some of the triggers. And um, and I, I actually I found that really interesting about how you're talking about how you can no longer tolerate dairy. I'm, I'm the same. I I can't. And it's 
yeah, it, that was one of the things I started learning about was the processes that that our our food goes through and and milk especially yeah. uh, in the in the dairy industry. It's yeah, it's really um, so. Yeah, yeah. I can now drink as long as it's either pasteurized, but I um, order raw milk, which is actually illegal to drink in Queensland. It's normally sold as bath milk, and I can I can drink that, and it's all fine. My body's just totally like, well, this is milk. I this is okay. Yeah. I can digest this. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. So, what I guess that leads on to um, the, the topic of you know how you started learning about the importance of of how we, um, how our food is produced and, you know, this whole area of, of farming. And what would you say has been one of the biggest causes of the disconnect that society has with their knowledge of where their food comes from and how it is produced? Good question. I think we've just got lazy. I think, I mean, if you sort of go back a couple of hundred years, how many of us actually lived in a city? Mm. And I think cities is where that big concrete jungle is about just not living a life that a human actually is designed to live. We used to live in small communities. All of us had acreage of some description, whether it was only half an acre. We were all, when we were hungry and we wanted um, some lamb or, or some beef or a chicken, we'd go out in the garden and actually mm. celebrate its life and, and kill it and then butcher it and eat it. And it would last for a long time. So when you're doing all of that, that's when you appreciate what the time and effort it takes to actually produce either an animal or food of any description, whether it's fruit or vegetables. And I think, yeah, living living the lives that we do, which is all now about technology and about buying things like consumerism and, and just throwing things away. Because also when we had rubbish, what did we do with it? We, we didn't have these great big landfills. Mm. We didn't have rubbish men taking our, our rubbish away. We didn't have plastic, you know, our lives have completely turned upside down because of both, um, the way that we've evolved with regards to the petrochemical side and, and globalization. Mm. And it's all, it's put so much pressure on our farmers. And that's one of the reasons why these things have changed because of course we as consumers go, we can't afford that. We want cheap. Mm. But what we've done is we've shot ourselves in the foot because cheap is not healthy anymore. And mm. it's putting huge stress on our farmers and our, on the livestock that we're producing our planet, the soil, our atmosphere, our oceans, rivers. Our rivers are not flowing in Australia for one reason, and it's because of our farming. Mm. Um, tell me, tell a, me a little bit about that. Is that is that from, yeah, did you explain that to me. Okay, so it, it comes back to our soil. So if you are intensively doing anything, it's the same with, with extremists. So if you are an extreme exerciser or if you're an extreme eater or if you're extreme gamer, anything that you do it's in an extreme way is not healthy for anything mm. or anybody. So when you are industrially farming and you are producing as much as you possibly can because it's all about yield, you are having to then put on a load of synthetic fertilizers and the more nitrogen you put on the thirstier the plant gets of course because it, you're telling it to grow 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 as quick as you possibly can okay i'm really thirsty so let's pump some water on well at the same time when you're doing that with monocultures you're and bare fallow which is means when you have nothing growing in your paddock at all you're releasing huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere mm. now when you do this you're actually stopping your soil from being able to infiltrate the rain that falls out of the sky. So what happens then is all that rain that falls out of the sky doesn't go in the soil, it runs off. Mm. And so it runs off with everything else that's attached to the top of the soil, whether it's your chemicals that you sprayed or your synthetic fertilizers or, or, um, or your just your topsoil. It's a com combination of all that. And it runs straight into the waterway. Now, this is then um, a really short cycle because, of course, once it's drained off your property, what's left behind? Something that's not got any moisture in it. So it's dry. So what do you have to do? You have to pump the water back on. So it's this cycle of 
this extreme way that we have put pressure on our paddocks or on our planet just in general with regards to uh, pumping water, irrigating and of course, when you're feeding, and, and this is the other thing, when we've been bashed into believing that we've got to feed billions of people, we don't have to feed billions of people. We, half the, the population is starving of, of the planet, plus we produce huge amounts of waste. Mm. And so there's this pressure on top of us all the time from those people in, in corporate um, organizations demanding this and trying to sell products and farming us all mm. that has now led to this whole breakdown of our planet and and this is what if you're led to believe down one rabbit hole the whole covid thing is about the whole ecosystem starting to degenerate basically mm. Yeah. And, and, and coming back to the soil, because that um, the, the way that things are at the moment, it makes the soil really compact, doesn't it? So it, it causes long-term issues, doesn't it? It's, there's many things that happens. Um, so yeah, we lose the topsoil to either flooding or to wind. We have compacted soil so it did, there's a lot of chemistry involved as well which I don't know too much about because I don't need to know it in depth like that mm -hmm. but there's a magnesium and calcium ratio so when you've got compacted soils it's normally because that ratio is not correct you need more calcium to, than magnesium however when you take the carbon out of the soil the carbon acts as like a great big beautiful sponge now think of carbon as a diamond rather than as a piece of coal. <laughs> um, it's a much nicer way of looking at carbon. Carbon is a beautiful thing. There's different ways of putting carbon back in the soil, but basically you need a lot of soil organic matter. So the mulching side of things, dead insects, uh, livestock poo. And then there's the other way where you need living, healthy, photosynthesizing plants, diverse range of them, not a monoculture, that absorb the carbon dioxide out of the air and then it pushes it down through the roots and it has this symbiotic relationship with the bacteria in the soil and, and protozoa and nematodes and, and all those things. And then it actually helps to push the carbon deep, deep, deep into the soil. And then with the roots as well, so different root systems, normally perennial, which means they last year after year rather than annuals that only last for a season or, or a year. Mm -hmm. They have the perennials have deeper roots. And so you're wanting this diverse range of, of plants for that reason to help with that, making it less compact, pushing the, the water and the carbon down deeper, feeding the different microbes in the soil, basically keeping the soil alive. There's mm -hmm. far more life in the soil than there is above the soil. Yeah. And it's, it's very underestimated, isn't it? Yeah, because we can't see it. That's mm. the thing. Yeah. Why, what are some of the reasons that industrial um, produced food is no longer healthy for us? It's a lot to do with the, the mineral density. Um, so when you're, and we've always been taught this from when we were little, it's not about the quantity, it's about the quality. So whatever you do, make sure you do it to your 100% ability and make sure it's done well. It doesn't matter how much you actually do. Um, and it's exactly the same when you're producing food. If you want to produce good quality, high mineral dense food, you have to be able to produce it with a, a healthy living soil. Mm. So the minerals are in the soil. Most of even Australia with our soils the way that they are, they're very old and friable and um, and people believe there's not much in them. There's plenty of minerals in them, but the soil's dead. So there's no exchange from the soil to the plant because it's the, the microbes that are living in the soil that feed the roots of the plant and the plant feeds the, the microbes to say, thank you, I need those minerals. Um, and then you've got this produce, whatever it is that you are growing, that is really super healthy. And so... When you're eating that type of food, you eat less of it. Um, so that has less impact on the planet. Um, you're eating the high mineral density. So you're, it's better for your health because mm -hmm. then you're less likely to get sick because you're, the minerals that you take from eating a plant, 
is not the minerals or the the vitamins that you take from a synthetic drug Mm. so you don't need supplements um you don't really need to go and see the doctor (laughs) because you're healthy and fit and everything's working how it should work yeah and so how can regenerative practices help our soil? And, you know, like, I, I, I guess um, giving a bit of an explanation of the, the differences bes- between, say, a conventional practice rather than um, switching over to regenerative. Okay, so um, when you are farming industrially, you are using synthetic fertilisers mm-hmm. that cost a lot of um that impacts the planet a lot more because of course it's got to be produced so it it takes a lot of electricity to produce it it takes a lot of transport and it's also synthetic Mm -hmm. so when you apply it to a natural system the amount that is actually being absorbed is very little and so then you've got a plant that's not really healthy now insects and pests come along to clean up they are our rubbish collectors and they will attack a plant that's sick So Mm -hmm. when you are growing a monoculture already, because it's a monoculture, there's only one root system in the soil in normally a dead soil, um, that plant's not healthy. So the insects come along and actually are doing us all a favor Mm -hmm. (laughs) because they're eating the food that we shouldn't be consuming because it's not healthy. So of course, then out comes the um, insecticides. And so when you do that, you're killing the entire system as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just going to kill a bad what what we consider a bad bug and there's something like for every one bad bug there's 1700 good bugs Mm. Um, and so you're wiping out an entire system so I hear people all the time say god when we used to drive 20 or 30 years ago out back our windscreen was covered in insects you know like it's raining that doesn't happen anymore we don't have the insects and if we don't have the insects we have no pollination we have no um clearing up of the rubbish we're just going to sit here and rot (laughs) in in stuff that should naturally be cleaned up and so then um the holding capacity of our soils decreases because the carbon's not there when you leave a paddock to bare fallow the temperature of the soil can get up to like 70 degrees or something. Mm-hmm. And it's the ero- it's open to erosion. So like I said, with the flooding, but those mm-hmm. wind um, storms, those dust storms that we've had with the wind, they're not natural. They are because the ground is not covered. Mm-hmm. And we go, well, we live in a country that's half of it, majority of it's desert. Well, that's okay to a certain point and yes mother nature will move dirt around because that's what she does she doesn't like anything standing still and being stagnant but not to the degree that we've seen it that's because we've overgrazed we've put so much stress on our um, soil um, and a lot of it is bare fallow because of course if it's not raining our farmers don't plant which you know is sensible because nothing's going to grow Mm. Um, and so it just gets hotter and hotter and drier and causes all sorts of problems it's 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 like a um it's just a bad cycle isn't it and it's yeah yeah how how can um well I guess let's talk about the mission of farming revolution and I guess the concept that you have to bring consumers to the forefront of our food production Yeah, it's this whole, I'm only that one person, Um, I'm not going to make a difference, so I'm just going to carry on my life the way it is. Well, we all can make a difference, and we are consumers, and it doesn't matter how how powerful a corporation is, if all the consumers disappear, that corporation is nothing. Mm. So we are starting to wake up, some of us, and especially with this whole COVID thing, because COVID has enabled this belief in in this whole uh, resurrection of community and and backing each other rather than nailing each other to a tree. That whole competition side, this is about collaboration. And there's a big difference between capitalistic competition and collaboration. So I'll just use an example here for farming revolution. If you live in the Brisbane, Gold Coast, Sun Coast, sunny, Sunshine Coast area, um, there's a Food Connect uh, 
food box, regenerative food box business in, in Brisbane. And you can order these food boxes online and they were regeneratively grown food. Mm. So I created the Regenerator app last year and I contacted Robert and I said, would you be interested in aligning your business with Farming Revolution? So what I'll do is I will include um, and, and promote basically Food Connect and provide a box with, with each purchase of the Regenerator app um, but there, at no stage was there any commission or any money going to exchange hands. All I'm doing is I'm providing them a service in return for them adding value to my business. Mm. And that is true collaboration. That's not mm. capitalism. It's working really well in the regenerative circles. This type of collaboration is phenomenal because when somebody believes in somebody else and you are kind of selling their product, but it's not for financial gain. It is no. literally because you are so passionate about what this is and it's the so right thing to do. So let's all jump on board and, and do this. So, yeah, consumers are so powerful and I just we, we just have to wake up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's about coming back to that community, isn't it? You know, and how as a community we can all work together to have you know, a, a better, a better world, a better, a better environment, a, a, you know, a healthier food source um, and just really supporting each other. And I think that that's just been so forgotten, especially, you know, I, I, yeah, I guess you mentioned it earlier when you were, you know, talking about how we used to live in communities and, you know, that was, it was the normal thing you'd have, you'd work together and we've gotten so busy that it's like, we don't have time to, to strip back that busyness and to work out what's really important. And I guess uh, we, as I mentioned, we recently, we moved onto a small acreage and, you know, as, as we've started planting our, our trees and we've started our veggie garden and it's, it's such a wake up to the, the time and love and energy that it takes to create food. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been a real wake up of, okay, so if we can make a small impact here, who else can we connect with and, and work together in our community to, to lift each other? Um, and I, I, I guess if we can do that on a larger scale, even when people don't live on an acreage, but they can make different choices and choose away from those, those high level um, corporations that are doing so much damage and, yeah. and yeah, I, just and what- looking Sorry. Yeah, what you'll find is your mindset will shift as well. So as you are growing, as you're putting investing more time and love, and you, it is love, you have to mm. love the land and, and plants and mother nature. And once you make that, uh, that step into how we used to be, we're not that far away from it. It's just literally you have to open yourself up and just step into it. Once you do that, you will then... Um, attract people and it that shift will be this is not financial this is about giving Mm. Um, and that's when we are all going to um, benefit um, and and that's the whole value add that I was talking about just it's a beautiful feeling and and that loving that you have because you're doing good Mm. but it doesn't have to be actually recognized (laughs) you recognize it and, and you just continue because that's who you are at the end of the day. Yeah. It's about nourishing and nurturing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, back on to what you were mentioning a little bit earlier about um, with conventional farming, using a lot of herbicides and fungicides and pesticides. I know that they, they strip the soil of, of all the good and the bad microorganisms and insects. Besides the poisons being detrimental to our health, what impact does this have ultimately on the quality of our food yeah well it was yeah it goes back to that whole um mineral density of of the food because if you've killed everything in the soil that those minerals cannot be uptaken by the plant Mm. so what happens is that's when the synthetics come out and you feed them well the the other minerals and macro and micro nutrients that is needed for a plant is hundreds compared to the NPK, nitrogen, potassium and and phosphorus. Mm. And that was because of science made just everything's been simplified. Everything's been narrowed down and and mother nature isn't. 
she is complete she's not complicated mm. but she's very complex so when stupid humans come along and narrow everything down because it's got it is ultimately down to greed at the end of the day because they think they can make a buck out of it everything suffers so yeah so so your your plant's not uptaking it's been pretty stressed it's I've been under attack by pests because they see it as the, the plants actually let out like um, like a Morse code and, and the antennas of the pests of the insects actually pick up on it. And so that's how they see the plant needs. It's in distress. It needs clearing up. And so you can have a sick plant next to a healthy plant and the healthy plant survives because they can't see it. Mm. So it won't get attacked. Um, and this is what um, we're finding out now. It's, it's so interesting. We're growing food that's out of season. We are grow, um, then transporting food huge amounts of distances. Um, and sometimes, you know, I've heard of when you're selling them in supermarkets. So a bow and mango, for example, will travel all the way down to Sydney and then get sold back up into Queensland. That's that is just nonsensical that's ridiculous the, yeah. the amount of impact on our environment through travel petrol um yeah all that sort of and the time mm -hmm. like how old is it by the time it gets to to your pantry or your shelf it's interesting too i mean i guess leaning away from um you know even the issues with the the pesticides and herbicides you know even uh organic and sustainable cert certifications are not enough anymore are they what, what are some of the things that we would need to be aware of um, in terms of this? Yeah, unfortunately, organic has kind of shot itself in the foot with the whole certification side of things. Um, and I know some people get really upset by that thought process. I, I try and keep Farming Revolution as open as possible. And my opinions don't really count because I'm just looking for the truth all the time. But with that certification, I believe you shoot yourself in the foot with it because there are a list of rules that you do and don't do, which then stifles the farmer from actually being able to do exactly what they want to do. Uh, and I'm not talking about spraying chemicals or anything. I'm actually talking about adding whatever they need to add into the soil or doing something that the certification prevents them from doing. And so that's the beautiful thing with regenerative farming is that you're open to do whatever it takes to mm. make that soil productive. And this is where we're just at this beautiful tipping point of we need to be verified rather than certified. Mm. And this is actually happening now. There's uh, land to market down in Albury. The farmers that are, that are providing food for that market are um, being verified. Uh, and so there's certain things that they are testing. So it's the diversity of plants, diversity of insects. Um, so that's the environmental side, the quality of what, what your bricks reading is on your plants, which is how well your plant is photosynthesizing. So the better your plant is, the higher the number, the more sh sugars it's, it's feeding the microbes through into the roots. So your leaves your plant, when it photosynthesizes, produces sugars and it pushes it down through the roots into the soil to make that exchange for minerals with the, the microbes in the soil. Feeds them sugar. <laughs> <laughs> so they're addicted to sugar and, uh, and gives that they do that transfer with the whole mineral side of things. Yeah, well, and, um, and I guess I guess that with the organic thing as well is, you know, it's become a bit of a buzzword. So it's sort of, you know, I, I'm guessing... Uh, in my limited knowledge that um, a lot of organic certifications essentially are produced in a, I guess, a conventional way, but without the pesticides. And so. Uh, well, yeah, there's, much. there's, it all depends on the farmer. I, I, I've met organic farmers that are regenerative farmers, but the mm. only way that they can differentiate with their produce compared to the industrial produce is to certify themselves or, or, i know, think i was uh, thinking in more terms of say like woolworths for example with a um where they've got like a lot of organic products on the shelves um where it could be kind of like a marketing thing rather than a a true regenerative practice where they're they're really looking at the um the consumer at heart yeah that well anything to do with those big corporations you've just got to be very careful 
don't believe anything they say. You know, there's <laughs> there's some labeling that says our oh, Australian company, and then you actually read where the 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 whatever that so it might be a chocolate bar or something, or not, sorry, um, a nut and muesli bar. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and the produce isn't Australian, but the company is that's mm-hmm. packing and, and making it, but they're actually getting their whatever it is, whether it's their oats or, or whatever it is that makes the, the muesli bar from different countries, not, not Australia. So yes, you have got to be very careful. The good thing here in Australia is it's got that funny like bar that's got a, it's a green uh, rectangle with the mm-hmm. yellow. And so it sort of tells you how much percentage of the content is Australian grown. And okay. I, when that came in a couple of years ago, I was just like, oh, thank goodness, because we can actually, at a quick glance, you can go, that's less than 75%, put it back on the shelf. Okay, that's really interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Oh, really? Yeah, look look on the back of all of them. The, the worst ones are the cereals or any of the biscuits, as in um, like cheese, savoury biscuits. Mm-hmm. The majority of them, it's, it's all, some of them is, is almost zero from Aust- Australian um, produce. Cereals, I think the most I've seen is like 76% Australian grown. Wow. Um, Yeah. But the other thing as well, going back to the organic side with the actual farmers is it's their holistic. This is the difference between regenerative and and organic. It's the holistic approach. It's the whole systems approach that is taking or is, is understood how to grow that actual piece of food or or fruit or or whatever it is that you're growing so with the organic if they've got pests coming on instead of looking at where their soil is lacking what they will do is they'll actually reach for that spray whether it's well it will have to be an organic spray Mm. so their mindset hasn't actually changed to why are they getting pest attack Mm. all they're saying is we're getting pest attack we need to attack we need to kill Mm. Um, whereas regenerative farms will go we're getting attacked for some reason there must be low in boron or it must be low in silica or it must be something the ratios are not quite right here have I got enough diversity? What am I lacking? What family of species am I lacking? So it's a different mindset, a different approach. Yeah, I love that. And I, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up because it just, it really brings to the fore that, that point of regenerative practices really, really aim to boost the nutritional value of the foods by really that the grassroots movement of looking after the plant from the, the very very core of yeah. um yeah of the practices um i i want to move a little bit into meats at the um and i have a couple of questions about meats as well can we talk about uh grass-fed and grass-finished meats I, I know on the market there are so many options to purchase meat and can we talk about the difference between say conventional and grass-fed meats um and the impacts of these choices for both our health and environment as well Yeah, okay. So we're in a country that actually is very difficult to finish uh, cattle. Are we talking cattle then or um, livestock? Yeah, yeah, well, well, I guess we'll start with cattle and then if there's anything else that you wanted to add into that. Very difficult to grass finish cattle in Australia when we swing between droughts and flooding all the time. It can be done and there are certain parts of Australia it is being done and it's been done really well. As long as the grass is full of nutrients, as long as they are uh, timed rotationally grazing their livestock, then that meat is the creme de la creme. That is the Mm -hmm. best meat you can get. And if they're butchering it on site as well, which is actually um, happening, but on a very small scale, um, then that is the primo. Mm. Of course, you're going to be paying for that as well. (laughs) And that's the thing with with consumers. We have to open our eyes and go, if this is quality, if the love and time has been put into producing this food, we need to dig deeper into our wallets and and pay what it's actually worth, Mm. which will probably lead you on to the next question that you're going to ask me. So I'll I'll back off a bit there. Um, Oh, no, I I think that's a really valid point. And I think so many are scared to put the um the investment in or you know that they sort of you know they're thinking to save on a week-to-week basis but one of the things that I look at in terms of my food choices and my food purchases is if I wasn't choosing to invest in healthy options 
I will end up paying for it later. Absolutely. With sick well, care. <laughs> well, we you're well done because yeah. there's not many people that think like that. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, well done because that is absolutely hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And that's what's happening to society. We're, we're breaking for that reason because we always reach for the cheaper. Yeah, and the, the quick the quick option and the... Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, um, it's, you know, it goes back to that old fable of, you know, who wins the race, the hare or the tortoise? Mm, yeah. <laughs> you just keep coming back to that fable. It's a very old fable for a reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I love that. I love that you've brought that up. Um, and I guess that's a, a really a big point there, coming back to the, the grass-fed um, meat because oftentimes you'll see a lot of meats that are labeled grass-fed um, but they're actually grain finished and yeah. a lot of people I don't think are aware of that can you talk a little bit to that yeah no I wasn't didn't have a clue and I mean even two or three years into this regenerative journey I still didn't understand I thought every animal it would be better if you grass-fed them well not if they're starving in their paddocks <laughs> because mm. it hasn't rained for seven years mm. um, no so uh, they so what happens in in Australia? Um, there's what we has got such a bad name as the feeding lots, and it's got such a bad name because of America. It's a different system over here. Um, I don't agree or disagree with it. It's just the way it is with the way that we actually our food system with regards to producing meat mm-hmm. um, or beef. Uh, so the at a certain weight, the cattle comes off the paddock and then into a feedlot and it is then fed grain and unfortunately lots of other stuff uh, like cotton seed and things like that. That's the bit that I don't really agree with because mm. cattle shouldn't be, especially that type of food, they shouldn't be eating that. I mean, they can eat grain to a certain extent, but this is where that funny shift of argument is, well, that's why grass finished is much better than grain finished. Mm. However, like I said, not if your animal's starving at the end of the day. Anyway, um, they are normally not held in these feeding lots for a very long period of time. I think you can have 30, 60 and 90 days um, MSA, which is the Meat Standards Australia, um, because that's actually law. Uh, So, I'm pretty sure they're the three different categories. So then, of course, the the longest is 90 days Mm -hmm. um, in a feedlot where they're just fed um, to to boost their weight to actually um, so that they're sold for premium beef. Um, Now, the grain, if it's grown industrially, it's been sprayed chemicals. It's had synthetic Mm -hmm. fertilizers on. Mm -hmm. So you're actually starting your, your meat side of things with this in cocktail of of synthetics and chemicals Mm. and then we're eating it plus the animals in a feedlot and it has been used to roaming around in the paddock so it's not a natural environment they're pretty stressed and so Mm. the meat then becomes a bit stressed as well Mm. um but moving to america there's two different types of of feedlots um one is a feedlot where basically the animal is there from the beginning of its life to the end of its life, they actually have railway tracks that bring in soy that's been genetically engineered and corn that's been genetically engineered and grain that's probably been genetically engineered (laughs) plus frayed and and in the monoculture industrial setting. And these trains come in along the feedlots and deliver tons and tons and tons of, of this, what we would not class as food, but as Mm. what they class as food for their cattle. And the cattle are in these feedlots that are just dirt pens for however long it takes them to actually get to a certain weight before they are slaughtered. Mm. Um, I really, really don't agree with that on on any level of animal husbandry. Mm. Um, What I call it is factory or industrially producing meat. I totally understand why vegans are vegans when they are watching that um and i have to say that it's very different in australia to america but you see a lot of the american stuff Mm. the next one higher than that is called a cafo which is concentrated animal feeding operation which as you with just purely that name you kind of go oh god is that (laughs) that in australia or america 
No, that's America. I don't think it's actually in any other country apart from America. I haven't okay. seen it. Um, there's a movie or, or documentary called The Right to Harm. Mm-hmm. And I would strongly suggest that you do watch it. You don't see inside the sheds, but you get an understanding of what's going on. And it, it's actually exposing a public health crisis. Mm. Um, so you can imagine what's actually going on inside these sheds. Um, and that is big shed, thousands of animals, big intake fan on one end of the shed, a big extraction fan or several of them on the other side of the shed because the air inside is toxic. Mm. (laughs) And they're producing meat Mm. to feed us. Mm. But that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. Like what's healthy about this? And and this this documentary actually shows that people living a kilometre away are becoming sick. I mean, because and then the, yeah. away. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine what the animals are doing? Yeah. The noise, the smell, the stench, and then of course what they're doing with the um, the poo is it, it's toxic, it's septic because they're being brought up in an environment that they never see the sun, they mm. never see any grass. Like even birds are meant to eat grass. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's so disgusting. Mm. I totally understand why vegans are vegans. So when you bring this back to, and I really hope that the people that are listening are really open-minded about this because um, there's so much bad press and it's the media about the whole methane levels, the whole carbon dioxide levels and the nitrous oxide levels. They're all natural gases. What's happened is we are destroying the soil and the biology that helps to maintain those natural gases at a natural balance level. Mm. Therefore, we are now suffering the consequences with the whole climate change side of things and that the increases of those gases in the atmosphere. It is not to do with regeneratively grazing animals Mm. because there is bacteria in the ground that um, breaks down methane. If, If we didn't have animals producing methane, we wouldn't have that bacteria. We produce methane. Mm. (laughs) We just don't Mm. lie on the grass anymore. (laughs) Yeah. But when you're talking about feedlots, yeah, those feedlots and that CAFO, they are producing disgusting pollution levels of of all these gases. Um, But when you're talking about proper regeneratively farmed animals, um, you're you're talking about a beautiful balance. So Mm. everything, as Mother Nature intended it, is looking after itself. Um, And so do not blame cattle farmers for the high methane levels in in the atmosphere. Yeah, and I I think there's a huge push at the moment for, you know, like the fake meat industry. I think there's a huge push that's sort of coming for that, which is which is really quite devastating because when when um, when farming is done correctly, um, it doesn't cause what exactly like you say it doesn't cause the issues and yeah. you know and what what could you suggest to australian consumers who who do eat meat um, but want to choose the best meat for their health um meat that is you know uh, from a uh, that is brought up from a regenerative perspective what is there anything you can suggest to help um someone make choices Cause, i mean obviously um on one on one side everyone you know on one side of the camp there's you know we'll just eat the (laughs) the fake meat um the other options and and that can cause health issues in itself and then there's the the side where no there is actually a healthy way to eat meat and to produce meat so yeah Yeah, absolutely advice that you've got there don't buy meat from a supermarket yeah. buy meat from either a local butcher unfortunately when we went on to this whole bandwagon of supermarkets popping up everywhere our local butchers all died a death didn't they same as the candlestick maker mm. <laughs> and the baker <laughs> yeah. it all got centralized um we need to decentralize it mm. uh we need to meet like i i go to a super butcher here in in oxenford and i talk to them about the meat um 
they haven't quite caught up with the regenerative side of things because I have had this whole grass fed <laughs> discussion mm. and apparently that's not good quality meat. Um, but so I just left it. I wasn't going to force my point on it. I actually buy beef that has been raised with seaweed. What they found is that it helps to reduce the methane level that cattle produce. But as I've already explained, it's not really a problem unless the cattle are in an environment mm. that's not natural to them. Really understand where your local butchers do some research because there's um, a couple of, um, well, there's one definitely, Provenir. He is, um, oh no, I'm going to forget his name. Sorry, I've forgotten his name. But he goes on site to your farm. And they, and most of these farmers, because they're wanting to produce small amounts of beef, but quality, they, of course, are not trying to cull a hundred mm. head in a day, <laughs> which yeah, is yeah. probably these big operations do handle. Um, I don't know. I don't know the numbers. But he does it on farm. He says a little prayer before it all happens. He goes into this box. Nothing, no, none of the other animals understand what's going on. They don't know. He just knocks them hangs them and then off farm butchering it's a beautiful process and and when you listen to him talking he he loves what he does because it's the right way of doing it and you can't kill an animal of any description without respect because it's a life that you're taking at the end of the day yeah yeah and and I've become more and more aware of that you know we've got chickens on our, our little plot um and it's so interesting to to connect with the animal in that way, knowing that that animal is providing us food, and you know, eventually they will get to the point when when we do eat them as well. But you know, really being able to celebrate that cycle of yeah. this animal to have a beautiful life, to free range on our little our little plot, uh, and I know that we're we're quite privileged to experience that. Um, but I'm and that like- sorry, just coming to that point, that death is life. Mm. as parents or as community or as Christians I don't really know what it is but we're scared of death Mm. um I I'm not scared of death because I've now trained myself to understand that it is all part of the cycle um I lost two mates when they were 18 to cancer and I was 19 and um, at the same time my mum was diagnosed with cancer as well and I just they were fit healthy individuals and yet cancer had just got got them and it was I'd been protected from death for my entire life and I had to deal with that at being 19 years old Mm. and I wish I'd been able to understand death as a two or three year old Mm. and my daughter she actually had two fantail doves and one got taken by a snake it's horrific watching that Mm, (laughs) and and she wasn't quite that young she was about four or five and it was heartbreaking for me to watch this young child understand that she was never going to have this animal again but now as a 12 year old she understands death and Mm. in actual fact we I I did knock a rooster over the other day Um, I've never eaten rooster before but um, I went this is the first time I'm going to eat sorry, kill and eat something. Mm. So we sat and watched on YouTube. I said, Kobe, this is going to be pretty gruesome because I need to know how to actually kill it properly. So we watched it and she was absolutely fine with it. Mm. And I went, thank goodness, because at 12, I couldn't have coped with that. Mm. Because How beautiful though that she understands where her food's coming from, you know. Exactly. um, And that as well. Because there's such a disconnect, I I feel. Um, There is such a disconnect because, you know, we're so used to being able to go to the supermarket and pick something up off the shelf and there's no sort of reverence put to where our food comes from. And that that comes from not only um, the, you know, the meat industry, but also our, where we get our our fruits and veg, you know, you don't realize how much love needs to go into food growing um until yeah you you're really connected to that um can can you share how the decisions made by consumers can have a direct impact on our farmers welfare I think consumers have a massive um what's the word oh no I'm gonna forget the word their their value of what our farmers do is priority I think that has that beautiful 
uh, knock on effect to our farmers that they're actually appreciated. Because what I see, especially in Australia, because our farmers over here are not subsidized, whereas in the UK <clears throat> and in Europe, they're subsidized. That's why there's so much food waste. And so our farmers, I believe, because they're not subsidized, they're in a really, really strong position because there's no governmental um, input that they have to abide by or, or any of those rules. So they are really free as farmers compared to other parts of the world. Um, and I think that for them to produce food that they know their consumers really appreciate. So that's where I go back to that Food Connect in Brisbane. Mm. Um, it's a pleasure to receive that food box every week or every two weeks because the food is so good it lasts for two weeks. Mm. Um, and, and I know that those farmers have cared for their soil. They care about themselves and they've got time to um, celebrate their own lives, whereas most farmers are working seven days a week, 24 hours a day kind of thing. You know, mm. they're, they're flogging themselves into the ground because of the system that they're in. Whereas these regenerative farmers, they've got smiles on their faces and they're genuine smiles. Mm. Um, and, and I think as consumers, we, we need to recognise it, we need to value it, we need to pay for it. Um, and we need to celebrate our Australian farmers because they are the most resilient farmers on this planet. Mm. Very, they are really, really incredible. And I think one of the times I got really, really cross and upset was when we had those droughts and the media went and shoved a camera in those farmers' faces and they were crying mm. um, and they'd come to their absolute wit's end. And I went, nobody should see a farmer cry because if our farmers are crying, we're at the end of the road. Mm. Farmers don't cry. <laughs> when mm. you see them crying, that's it. Mm. And then, of course, we had the big let's raise money and, and bloody supermarkets jumped on the bandwagon. Let's raise money for our farmers. But we're not going to put the price of the milk up past a dollar a, a litre. But we're going to raise all this money and look like we're doing everything. It's all marketing and it's all into your heads of the consumers and it's all wrong. Mm. So let's pay our farmers what they're worth. Mm. So what, so what strategies do you have in place to bring Australian farmers and consumers closer together to protect our food? Education is the first one. Um, I know plenty of regenerative consultants or coaches where they are, are taking the, the holistic approach to, look, you, you've got to, as a farmer, what is it that you are struggling with? Mm. Okay, what is it that you want out of your farm and your life? What is it that, you know, it's that holistic approach. It's not just how much, how many seeds did you put in the soil and what's your yield going to be, which is what mm. it's like now. So that side of it is really well looked after. There's some amazing regenerative coaches out in Australia. Um, and then Farming Revolution is a platform where everybody, whether you're a farmer or whether you're a consumer, can go to and watch how other people have actually done it or have a conversation with somebody who has had an autoimmune disease or you know there's I just I'm trying to build up a community where people are individuals but collaborated so that we are all together mm. um, and everybody who I speak to is up for that you know there's not or there's been a few people that have gone, nah, no, you're not good enough. Or, but that's their problem. That's their issue. That's nothing to do with me. Mm, <laughs> I just yeah. go, well, it's your loss then if you don't want to be a part of this. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, education is the big thing. Because, of course, at the moment, if, if or say all of your listeners then just went, right, I'm going to eat regenerative food, they're going to go, well, where are we going to buy it? Mm. Um, because it's not available in mainstream yet. I would love to see the goal of farming revolution is that there is no longer a farming revolution needed mm. um, and I will evolve into something else then maybe it would be farming evolution mm. <laughs> love it. Um, uh, because yeah things will happen um, and but what we don't want is we don't want certification we don't want those greedy bastards jumping on the bandwagon going oh everything's regenerative now let's just put the name on the package yeah yeah. No, it's not that. It's far more than that. And um, yeah, consumers, it just 
keep in contact with with farming revolution however often you want to just so that you can go back to those grassroots and 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 when things are evolving into something and and more and more markets uh, regenerative like market um sheds are, are being built and and there's one up at uh, sunshine coast actually at coolham which is on the it's being developed and um, that will be hopefully open next year uh, and those sorts of areas more and more of those are springing up um, mm. and people are just going to be aware of it and understand oh regenerative i know that because of farming revolution and mm. let's go and let's see and support and taste you've got to taste the difference yeah, and you know, and use our our back pocket to 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 drive the change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But don't like I I don't want it to be ridiculously expensive. Like, unfortunately, organic that was the major problem was that it priced itself out of the average market. Yeah, yeah. that's silly. That's not business sense. No, that's stupidity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because well, then you've reduced your your overall. Um, market or you know people consumers and yeah it's silly it's it's just going to die a death eventually so so I guess then so looking at that I mean and I I don't want people to think that this is to, to feel like this is unachievable if they live in a city um what what can you suggest to someone who lives in a city who may not have uh local farmers nearby um you know, like what? What can you can you suggest to help them on this path uh, to with the and help and help them see that collectively we have the power to make change happen yeah. by demanding more regeneratively grown food. Is there anything that you can share to help people start to make changes in what they're choosing? There is um, food boxes in Newcastle and Sydney as well. They are regenerative and transitional farmers. Your food collective. I was, I was trying to remember the name. So Your Food Collective, they are food boxes again, just like up here in Brisbane, Gold Coast area, which is Food Connect. Mm -hmm. So look at them uh, down in Albury. They've got that land to market. So like I said, there are areas or places springing up, especially around cities, because, of course, we all want to be producing food for a city because that's a huge number of people. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. where we're going to sell the most. And um, if you're in a city and there's so many regenerative job opportunities, but you got to want to set up your own business, really. So, for example, green waste removal is huge. I know it's happening in Melbourne, actually. I haven't looked into it, so I don't know the company names or anything. But yes, they've got several restaurants that they remove the green waste. And I'm pretty sure... It's either composted or worms, or is it composted and produces a fuel or something? Okay. There's something really tricky going on in the middle of Melbourne. <laughs> All right, I remember exactly what it is. But yeah, there's there's opportunities everywhere. Don't think just because you're in the middle of a concrete jungle that you can't do stuff. You mm -hmm. really can. And then if you just think about London, for example, they have they they have and and had allotments for a reason. Mm. And the allotments came into play when the world wars were happening because what they did was they cut off the, the road supplies from the country to the cities. That's how that they were starving populations to try and win the war. And London had its own allotments. Yeah, <laughs> so wow. it was producing its own food. Get together. If there's a piece of council dirt or, or I know you have to go through a lot of red tape, unfortunately, or even a privately owned something or other. And you're like, this has been sat here for years. What's the plan here? Mm. Go and knock on doors or go and investigate in the council chamber or wherever and just see, can we actually build a garden here? Mm. Um, because, again, it's called a community garden for a reason. <laughs> it yeah. brings people together. Yeah. And that connection is so important in times like this. Absolutely. Mm. More so than anything. Like you see those blocks of flats or you call them apartments over here, all, all uh, locked down. And if they just had, they could all be locked down and all still go outside literally into where the car park is. But there's a garden there, for example, mm. yeah. and, and garden like they're, they're still in lockdown and they're still all together. And yeah, like how much better would life be? Yeah. It's such a beautiful vision to mm. see. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's just really important to plant that seed for people that there is more possibility. And yeah. Yeah. But don't wait for somebody to come knocking on your door going, oh, we're going to build a garden. 
go out there and grab life by the balls and run. Mm. Like just just yeah. do it yourself. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> 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 but no, I honestly, I love everything that you're doing. And I love, I love your vision and how, you know, yeah, how you are, are driving um, the, the message that collectively we can make change and it's not out of reach. And, you know, I, I, we can, we can choose to support things that are going to help our environment and help our health. And, um, and I, I really love the, the message that you're sharing. And I just, I think it's just such an important um it's just an important area that people need to be more aware of. And it's one of those things once you, once you start to learn and I, as I said, I'm regenerative farming and the, and the information and my knowledge around that is, is, is still quite new. Um, but once you start to learn, you can't unlearn. No. And that's the beauty. Mm. Um, yeah. Just that, that impact of, Oh, wait a minute. And it has that domino effect. Yeah. positively though that you just go yeah oh, well if that happens that happens that happens and then yeah. you just how am I actually going to explain this to the average lay person because yeah <laughs> yeah but, but that's what's so fascinating about it is that if you have an autoimmune disease you can hone in on that if you have mental health issues because your brain is attached to your gut or the your gut the, mm. or both ways you know and so if you're ill in your gut you're ill in the brain mm. and and so psychologists and, and psychiatrists really really need to completely and utterly understand how regenerative food can help their patients yeah. then you go on to um, the connection or the unity that we need to create between first nations people and us mm. um, is huge and listening to country if you talk her language, you can provide that beautiful unity and and equalness between two totally different cultures mm. and one culture that we've tried to make extinct and to acknowledge that and to share each other's values, positive mm. values, not, not our destructive negative values. Yeah, and, um, and share the knowledge and learn and in, in work together. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, if, if you're interested in the environment, then the environment farming regeneratively improves your environment. Regenerative farmers are finding that if they give 25 percent of their land back to nature, mm. their farming actually improves. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? Because yeah. you've got diversity, you've got trees, you've got insects, good and bad. You've got so that means you've got pollinators and you've got you're creating your own ecosystem on your property rather than flat monoculture desiccated ground yeah. that's that's dead and, yeah. and then lays bare like mother nature does not lay any part of her bare even deserts yeah. have life in them it's so, so interesting that you bring that up because it, isn't it such an odd thing that we have grass and that it's such a pride to have like grass <laughs> you know, like the wars that people have over their lawns always yeah, makes me laugh with without weeds and the yeah weeds without weeds. actually telling you yeah your grass is crap <laughs> yeah and it's so interesting because you know like uh, my husband and I were talking about this recently about um how important weeds are to our ecosystem yeah and, you know, and we were talking about like it, we were sort of going down a bit of a rabbit hole. He'd listened to a recent podcast, and it was so interesting to to just dive into that and to look at where we are, where it's you know as soon as there is a weed, it's sort of you know in society it's killed off, and but that weed has so many things that it helps the ecosystem with, and it causes you know there's all sorts of issues that come from that. But um, yeah. you know what what if instead of having our perfectly manicured lawns we all had a little garden in our yard. Yeah, just a wild piece. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and, and honestly, you would go out there and there would just be an abundance and, of diverse mm. insects and animals and birds and butterflies. And you would be quite happy. You, you know, you can cut it every now and again, but allow it to grow up. So mm. we have this thing in Jersey where we allow our hedgerows to grow through spring. So it flowers and then it goes to seed. And then we call it a broncage, which is a Jersey French name for basically then cutting it right back. But we allow it that time for nature of our hedgerows to actually be natural. 
mm. and to do the job of, of this beautiful cycle. Jersey farmers used to, I don't think they do it much anymore because of the whole industrial way that we live our lives. They used to take the rack off the beach, which is all the seaweed and kelp that's mm -hmm. brought up from the uh, Atlantic storms, and take that rich fertilizer that is free and put it on their paddocks. And so if I go back to going back to the thyroid issue, my mates on Jersey, not one person has got a thyroid issue. Because the iodine. So that's telling you something, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> that yeah. seaweed is really important on your land. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's just, it's so interesting when you start diving into all the different areas and um, yeah, I just, no, I, th I think that this, this conversation is a really great starting point and yeah, just, I, I encourage anyone who's listening to dig a little deeper and um, yeah, start looking into, into this a little bit more. Um, I've been falling absolutely in love with, um, with uh, permaculture since we've moved down here and just looking, like looking into how we can best utilize our land and to have that diverse range of, of things growing together and, and trying to, yeah, like to spot where things are unbalanced to try and help it together, <laughs> if that makes sense. But um, no, no, absolutely. Diversity and no kill, that is how we're going to evolve to regenerate our land, our health, mm. everything, our society, because, yeah, it's got to be diverse and we've got to just flip this mindset and just stop killing stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah if it's for there sure. it's there for a reason why yeah. is it there oh yeah. okay yeah I didn't do that very well so that's why it's here <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I will yeah. change that and I'll make sure that I do that the correct way or, or whatever you know so yeah 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 no, it's a I different love that. way rather than reaching for a quick fix mm. you, you've got to delve a lot deeper yeah yeah for sure Gosh, we have covered so much in this in yeah. this conversation, and um, I I would love to finish off by asking three questions. Um, the the first was, what is your favourite quote and why? Right, I'm not sure if I made this up or whether I saw it somewhere, but either way, it's uh, last year I invested in myself. So you never lose when you invest in yourself was the little quote that I came up with. Mm -hmm. um, I invested in editing software and a marketing course that lasted all year. And <laughs> you would have laughed because marketing and me, it's literally like black and white chalk and cheese. I just, I'm not one of these people that gets uh, wrapped up in that whole marketing I think it's yeah I struggle of... with it too don't worry <laughs> yeah but I needed to know it because yeah. I need to know apparently how everybody else ticks so <laughs> I just kept saying to myself and every time I wanted to fight with whoever was teaching me about this that this is the way it's done I'm like I don't agree with that because um anyway I was like I've invested in myself so I can't lose if I've invested in myself because there was a lot of times I just thought oh what a waste of money what a waste of time and, and that's the natural way that you cope with stuff. Mm. And I went, no, Tamsin, you think of it as you've invested time and effort and money into you. So you make this work. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you never lose when you invest in yourself. Yeah. And sometimes when you feel the resistance to things, it's it's something that's actually opening you up to, to more opportunities and more knowledge. You know, I think, yeah. and I think that that's, that can be that, that quote. Um, and I guess that um, the statement of, you know, feeling the resistance is, you know, the, you, when you start this journey into regenerative farming and the choices that you make, it can, you can feel a lot of resistance that comes up because yeah. it's doing things so differently to how you have always done things. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Again, hit the nail on the head there. And that's what's quite frightening to the majority of farmers who want to change but just don't know how. Mm. They're scrutinised by, by their local community. I mean, some people years ago when, when they did it and they just went, this is not right, um, I'm going to come off the chemicals, nobody talked to them. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's really alienating when you're already in the rural area where there's not many people anyway. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just to have that resilience and that, 
resolve just to say, no, this is what I believe. This is what's going to happen. Yeah. And of course, they've they flourished in the long run. And actually now their neighbours are now knocking on their door going, oh, well, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> it's just human nature. You just have yeah. to laugh, otherwise you cry. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so what would be the most important piece of advice you would have given to your younger self? Yeah, uh, so I've had a pretty um, up and down life, really. I think I would actually say to myself, listen, you can't control your life but you can train yourself to adapt to it. I love that. Yeah, I think it pretty well speaks for itself. Yeah, that's really powerful. And, and what would you say would be the biggest challenge that became your biggest lesson? The most uh, profound thing that's ever happened to me was my mum died when I was 22. So she was 52. So like I, I said earlier about my friends dying when they were 18, well, mm-hmm. she was actually diagnosed at 48. Um, so it was, it was lumps of cancer, but it wasn't in anything. It was just growing off her bowel wall. They operated and they took a kidney out she was actually devastated that they took a kidney out, but it was all wrapped around it. And so she'd had, um, kidney infections for the the years leading up to it. She had had warning signs, but she ignored them. So watching my mum die, um, was, was, really difficult and interesting in a weird way on so many different levels and I remember her saying to me I'm not ready to die and that really cut deep because Mm. of course she's 52 so when I was 22 52 sounded quite old (laughs) but I'm now 45 and I'm getting closer to that 52 mark going, shit, it actually was really quite young. And to get to that age and not feel that you've actually lived your life to its fullest is something that I could never, ever allow myself to do. So that was a really big lesson. And I want, I, I like if I die tomorrow, I've lived my life to my fullest. I've put in 100% of my life. I don't live every day as if it's my last because I would be exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I have lived it so that if I die tomorrow, you know what? I've tried my hardest. I've done everything that I want to do. Of course, I've still got loads of stuff to do, but it's not essential. It's I am exactly where I'm meant to be right now with Farming Revolution. And that's then such the a, is- a beautiful thing to share and, and thank you for your vulnerability in, in sharing that and I'm, I'm so sorry that you went through that at such a young age um, and yeah I just I, I, I think it's really beautiful how you've you've taken um, such a tragedy um, and it has really cemented uh, such a beautiful um, imprint of, of on your life that has allowed you to really uh, aim to live your life to the fullest each day yeah and and it has really helped me to give back because everything is put into perspective when death is on the table mm. um and you've got to be happy with yourself with what you're doing not to try and please other people not to fit in with whatever it is that you're fitting into if yeah. you want to be yourself and you want to do something that's different do it yeah because it's your life at the end of the day um, yeah. and you need to be happy with you. And I think there's so many mental problems with society because of this, there's so much pressure put on everybody. Yeah. If you don't want to do whatever it is that you are expected to do, don't do it. Yeah. Do Change. whatever it is. Yeah. That is you are passionate about. And as you can hear the way I'm speaking, I am so passionate about regenerative farming yeah. because it's the only thing on this planet that makes any sense yeah no I and I, I completely resonate with with what you're saying we um we lost my my husband's mum last year and it's so interesting you know as you were talking and you were telling me as your story just then it's it, it became really clear to me in my mind that so much has changed in uh, what is important to my husband and I since uh since that since that experience and you know, we've, we, you know, we moved um, a couple of months after we lost her, um, his mum, and, you know, it's so much of what we do now is we are filtering regeneration into every part of our life, uh, and not just in what we're doing food-wise, but in, you know, it, uh, what we're doing on our day-to-day basis is this something that is giving life or taking life? Yeah, absolutely. And, 
I, um, yeah, I just think that it was just so profound, um, what you shared and yeah, I just really resonated with that. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Regeneration is, and this is why if you hop onto LinkedIn and you see, oh, she's talking to, um, corporations and, and business owners and people that work in offices about regenerative farming. How the hell does that fit in? But once you open the Pandora's box, <laughs> mm. you realize, oh, wow, okay, regeneration starts from within. Mm. Yes, so much so, so much so. Oh my goodness, what what a conversation! Um, gosh, I think we I think we could talk for hours and hours and hours. I just I yep. um yeah, there's so many levels to it, and I just I really um I really appreciate your time, uh, and I really appreciate all that you are doing to to give more life to the processes um, that that nourish and nurture us uh, in the long run, and um, I, I just think it's such important work that you're doing. So thank you so much for all that you're doing. Um, where can our listeners find you if they want to learn more about your your vision and your mission and everything that you're creating? Um, yeah, where can they find you? Okay, so if you like looking at websites, go to farmingrevolution.com.au. It sort of explains sort of everything really at a, a fairly easy level. Uh, and it also will introduce you to farmers who are regenerative farming, whether it's dairy, livestock, um, orchards, plantations, cropping. Um, it introduces you to, I mean, I know that there's more than these people doing it, but it's just an introduction. What I'm really going for at the moment is Farming Revolution YouTube channel. If you can subscribe, even if you some of it is to do quite in depth with the farming side of it and you are a consumer, I will be putting more consumer things on there as well. Just at the moment, I've just sort of gone down this branch of of getting these coaches to the forefront of what's happening in, in the farming side of things so that they can do what they are good at then I can go down the other branch, which is the consumer side and, and let and give consumers more of a, a whole appreciation to our food system. And I'm starting a new series, depending on COVID, of course, it's called In the Back of the Ute. I'm just literally sitting in the back of the Ute. So it's a bit of fun. <laughs> I'm talking to regenerative people and that can be in all walks of life, whether you're a dietitian, a, a mental health person, um, you know, a footy player or a, um, a farmer or somebody who, who's got a farm shop or, you know, the, there's so many of us out there on different levels in different spheres of, of influence. And if I can get them in the back of the ute and have a yarn, that's perfect. And then, yeah, so that was the Farming Revolution YouTube channel. And that's the one that I'm really pushing at the moment because subscribers is what what's going to keep me financially viable mm -hmm. um, but I've got quite a few to go I think I've got 96 and I need a hundred thousand okay <laughs> but let's get pressing so everyone join on, join on. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah because I did the editing and I love filming I love that's the artistic side the creative side so the filming and and documenting other people's um uh, lives and personalities and regenerativeness that's what I love I'm so passionate about sharing other people what, what they do because we are all just here and and need to provide that value add for all of our lives and we all and, have different yeah. strengths and it, that's the beautiful thing about bringing community together and really sharing uh, our strengths with one another so that we can all lift each other exactly so when when you succeed I succeed yeah and if you can think and, and train your brain to to because for of sure and I think when anyone when you see anyone succeeding all it is is an invitation to what is possible yes perfect mm. yeah that's a good one yeah I like that <laughs> well thank you so much for your time I've just loved our conversation and mm. Yes, uh, um, please, if anyone would like to learn more about Farming Revolution, please get in touch with Tamsin. She's amazing. Um, but thank you so much for your time. I, I truly appreciate you. Thank you, Amy. I'll, I'll invite me back in a year's time. We can have another conversation, see how far it's got. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. Absolutely. <laughs> see how you're going with your garden as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully I would have grown something by then. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, love and commitment, that's what it takes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks, Amy.
Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed this episode and know someone who would also benefit from the conversation, I would love it if you could please text them the link to this episode so they can have a listen. This is probably the easiest way they can access it. As always, I love hearing from you. Be sure to leave a rating and a comment about what you enjoyed most on your favorite podcast platform so that more people get the opportunity to see this podcast and together we can support more women to uplevel their lives. Feel free to contact me further on either Facebook or Instagram at Amy Innes Health or email me direct via my website, amyinnes.com, where you can also download my free gift that I created to help you ditch the toxic shit in your home. So grateful to have you here. Till next time, take care.